Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the alchemical process behind psychological change. Thank you for joining me on this channel where we talk about your psychology, what is going on with it, how do you manage your psychology, and how do you get yourself to do the things that you want to do, and how do you stop doing the things that you really want to stop doing. How am I starting this? I'm starting this like a podcast. But I think this is just going to be a video, whatever. But yeah, your psychology, that's what we talk about here. You know, you come to this place in your life where you feel confined, stuck, stagnant, and you want to do something. You want to change. But a year goes by and you're still doing the same thing. Well, what's going on? Well, clearly there's an unconscious process, right? There is something going on emotionally, unconsciously that you are not aware of. That was, that's what makes it unconscious. And we need to bring awareness to that. First of all, we need to bring awareness to that, bring it out of the open. And then from there, the, uh, the, the mechanisms behind what we're becoming aware of is going to inform how we're going to change. Does that sound confusing? In a sense, we're just looking at what emotions are, how they operate. And then that gives us all the information that we need in order to change. Now, nobody else really talks about, no other therapist or psychologist or psychiatrist talks about emotions and what they are exactly. But that's what we do here. And that's what allows us to create this process for change. And this isn't just me who says that there's a process for change. Other people have said this. I mean, and I get a lot of criticism. I mean, not, I don't know if it's criticism so much, just people who disagree. Is that... Is that really good criticism? Am I making up that more people criticize me so I feel more important? Like when you say you have haters, even though it's just somebody who disagreed with something you said, dude. I, I think you're, you're saying that you have haters so you feel better about yourself. Because if there's people against you, then that somehow makes your life more meaningful. Like how we get addicted to our struggle, you know, struggle addiction. And it really just makes this thing that you're working on, whether it's a business or a project or whatever, it makes it seem like a bigger deal than it is if you say that it's this huge struggle and oh, everybody's out there, everybody's out there trying to uh, oppress me, trying to, to repress my ideas because they're so good. Yeah, maybe, and then people <laughs> disagree, but it, that's really more of a projection of your anxiety. You know, whatever you think out there is holding you back. I mean, there are things out there that hold you back. Of course, an oppression exists. But what's ultimately going on? You know, if you're lying on your deathbed and, and you're honest, what, what's really holding you back? It's these inner demons, right, that we project out there and say, oh, it's the haters out there. But I do get criticism for saying that there is a methodology for psychological change, that there's a methodology for therapy. There are some specific processes that we all need to go through, that we all need to go through, every single person that we all need to go through in order to change. Yeah, there are specific processes we all need to go through in order to change. But what do therapists say? I mean, what's their go-to line? Oh, everybody's different. Everybody's experience, everybody's life situation is different. So when a new person comes into the clinic, you have to treat them like a completely new case. In a sense, not deriving any of your experience from the past. I mean, which is ridiculous. Of course you derive your experience from the past. It's just be honest about what you're deriving from the past. Be honest about the connections that you're making, which is based on your epistemology and how you see the world. To, you know, just be honest about that and let's truth test it. Because when we're honest about it, bring it out of the open, then we can truth test those premises, those biases, to put it in a pejorative sense. But it's really just premises. And those biases could be correct, they could be incorrect. It's like saying, oh, well, every bridge is different. Yeah, every bridge is different. <laughs> but, but there are principles of bridge building. <laughs> so, okay, we're working with a little bit different topography here, a little bit different earth. You know, there, ooh, the, the earth over here is a little bit more sand than the earth over there, so we need to, you know, drill different footers. But there's principles to bridge building. I mean, if every arch, uh, architect, civil engineer, I don't know who designs bridges, says well, every bridge is different. Whatever we did to, to build a bridge in the past, you know, whatever success we had in bridge building in the past, we can't look at that now, right? Because this is a completely new situation. There is no place on earth that is exactly like this, such a, that this place where we're going to build this new bridge. That's true. But there are principles there. So let's take those principles and apply them. And that's what I want to talk about here in Edinger's book, Edward Edinger's book, The Anatomy of the Psyche. 
which I have here, uh, this here, right? Anatomy and the Psyche, I'm gonna talk about the principles in this book, the alchemical symbolism in psychotherapy. So something that we talk about here, and I've done other videos on alchemy. Uh, I'll link to it in the description. Uh, no, notably, I, I did a video on Jung's volume 12, Psychology and Alchemy. Uh, you know, what it is, uh, how the uh, alchemists took from the Gnostics, um, and, and how it was slightly different than uh, the Christian worldview going on at the time in the Middle Ages, Renaissance Middle Ages, when the alchemists were practicing, and what that meant, and how that evolved into chemistry, of course, but it also evolved into modern psychology. I don't think psycho modern psychology would be the same without uh, the alchemists. But there are specific... But, but in that video, I, I just talked about general principles of alchemy, what it means, how we practice it today, like, like the no-fat movement, right? That is very much an alchemical process that young men put themselves in. Now, we, we can argue all day about how no-fap or semen retention, whatever you want to say, <laughs> how it uh, you know, increases your testosterone and increases your ability to, to go out and, and meet women, uh, which all may be really helpful. And the only thing that I'm really going to say about no-fap and whether to do it is are you using masturbation, porn watching as a way to distract yourself from women or not? That's what Jung says about it. And I think that's the only uh, line that really needs to be said about whether to masturbate or whether to watch porn. Are you using it as a distraction from women? If you are, then it's unhealthy. And I would imagine that most men out there who use it, especially like, you know, internet uh, based pornography, that's probably a distraction. Uh, but it might not be. So there is a, I got distracted there talking about no fat, but yeah, okay. So in my old video on psychology and alchemy, again, I'll link in the description. There is uh, just general principles of alchemy and how we practice it today and, and how you really need to incorporate it into your life in order to grow. In this video, I want to talk about the specific steps of alchemy and how that relates specifically to the therapeutic process. You don't care about therapy, perhaps, but I know you do care about changing. We all care about changing. We all want to change. We all want to grow and evolve. If you don't think you need to grow and evolve, then your next growth and evolution is the awareness of what of your next stage in, in growth and evolution. So we're going to talk about what the alchemists did in their alchemical processes and how that informs how we're supposed to grow and evolve now. Because right, what were the alchemists doing? What do I say in my video on, uh, you know, volume 12, Psychology and Alchemy? We, you know, the, the uh, alchemists didn't know anything about the exact processes behind chemistry, right? So they would combine two substances and they, they had to come up with some explanation, right? They didn't know what... Um, elements, I mean, they knew what elements were to some degree, but they didn't understand the process behind change. Not until Mendeleev, right? So they projected, right? They, they projected their own psychology out onto, onto the alchemy they were performing and their projection, well, yeah, the alchemy that they were performing inadvertently, of course, says a lot about our psychology and what we need to go through. I mean, this is Jung's insight. Um, you know, it, it's just amazing that, that somebody like Jung, you know, I, I say that in my book, what, one way to become more aware is to seek to understand the irrational. And I think what I say in there is I've taken, you know, very much from Jung, if, if, if maybe, maybe not word for word, but effectively I am plagiarizing Jung in my book when I say, don't ask yourself whether something is true. Ask yourself whether something is true. Uh, ask yourself what something is true of. <laughs> Don't ask yourself whether something is true. Ask yourself what it's true of. Of course it's true of something. The question is, what is it true of? And it's just amazing to look at what Jung did. To go back to these medieval alchemists, you know, supposedly when uh, the, the Renaissance was happening, leading into the Enlightenment, we're getting back to nature. There are alchemists out there. There are still people who say, no, there's a spiritual principle in nature. They got big into astrology. And it was seen as, you know, completely backward at the time. It's like, no, we're investigating nature for what it is. And it's just amazing that somebody like Jung, who's very much a child of the Enlightenment, was able to look back and look at somebody, uh, look at what somebody like Paracelsus was doing and say, no, there's actually something really important going on here. And of course, you know, whether he's correct about his assertions, 
regarding astrology, it's immaterial. The point is there's an important psychological process here that eventually led to modern psychology. So let's talk about the, the process of therapeutic change. And I know I've talked about this before, you know, Jung says not so concretely, but he does say his process for psychological change is anamnesis, right? Just being honest, honest about the facts in your life, then incorporating emotions or anima integration, then like in a dream analysis, archetypes, I would say which stage of adult development you happen to be in, and then you work through those stages and you come to something called a self, a capital S self, as represented most notably in Western culture by Christ. But let's just look through, uh, look at the alchemy and so to shed more light on what this process is. So there are seven stages, and we're just going to go through the seven stages really quick, no big deal, just to let you know what's going on, to let you know that when I come out and on here and say, look, there's a methodology to the therapeutic process that we can apply to everybody, and this is in fact why we have a mental health crisis right now in our country. And it is a crisis, you know, to whatever extent, I don't know, um, right, suicide keeps climbing and you can't fake that. You can look at, uh, you know, the, the amount of people on psychiatric medication. Okay, well, we could just be prescribing more medication. So that may not be an indication of any crisis, but I mean, just the suicide. Suicide and I think the obesity to some degree, because that's just like, you're in pain and you're eating to distract yourself from pain. Uh, you know, which is fine, right? But we just got to be honest about what we're doing. Okay, so the seven stages of the alchemical process. The first one is calcinatio. There's a bunch of uh, Latin words here, and I'm sure I'm going to pronounce them incorrectly. Am I using the original pronunciation or the restored pronunciation or the classic restored? There's different kinds of pronunciations. I think notice, uh, most notably around C. Is it a hard C or a soft C? I'm just going to say calcinatio. And this is, in a sense, you take a solid substance and you heat it and you, you desiccate it, right? You, you, you dry up a solid substance. Well, what's going on there? How does this relate to therapy? Oh, and then what do you get well, when you heat a lot of solid substances? What's left behind is the salt. The salt, which is um, linked to the alchemic, uh, the alchemist, excuse me, linked to bit bitterness and wisdom, both bitterness and wisdom. Salt represents both, and of course, that's how wisdom often feels, right? We go through experiences in life, and they're painful. They're painful, and they suck. And we do get wisdom out of them. Like, we do learn lessons from them. But there's a part of us that always wants to go back and go, oh, did I really have to suffer that much? Well, maybe you did. And that's why salt's a great uh, representative of this stage of calcinatio, heating substance so much that it dries up. And this is likened to anamnesis, just talking through the facts in your life. You know, it, it's amazing. Uh, guys wonder, and I wonder too. I mean, I'm not just criticizing you guys. We wonder, oh, what, what do we talk about in therapy? You know, I don't know what to talk about. What could I possibly talk about? Can you just be honest about the facts in your life? Can you just go through major experiences, or at least experiences that you remember? It may not seem major, but I, I would argue if you remember it and you're talking about it, then it's probably significant to some degree. Even if it's not significant, there's something significant in the fact that you are talking about that. Can you just go through and talk about your life? Can you go to a group at the end of the week and simply talk about what happened? Talk about what things went well. Talk about what things didn't go well. Why they didn't go well. What does it mean that this one situation didn't go well? How are you responsible for that situation? That's all gravy, but can you simply talk about the situation without any kind of pretension, without any kind of false humility, without any kind of uh, braggadociousness? Can you do that? You know, that's difficult. I, I think maybe that seems easy, but to really just sit down and do it. Like I know uh, Nathaniel Brandon, right? He talks about in and somebody else who's an influence on him. He talks about in his book, The Six Pillars of Self-Esteem. He had a class and uh, he asked people to come up to the front and say, I like myself. Or no, he, he asked them to say, I have the right to exist. He said, like, can somebody from the class come up and simply say, I have the right to exist? And people would come up to the front of the class and they would say, I have the right to exist. And he would ask people, do you really believe that this person who just says they have the right to exist, they really have the right to exist? And 
everybody for, for, after everybody went they go no nobody really didn't seem like they really believed it either they were putting on a front you know being arrogant to cover up some insecurity or you could just hear the insecurity in their voice i have the right to exist that's difficult to say just going through the fact which is the fact of course that you know the fact of of uh, your life is of, of course you have the right to exist why can't you say that though i think that's all an outcrop of your just inability to to talk through situations in your life which is you know i'm not a catholic but i think um you know what catholics get right and the orthodox church does this to varying degree um i i mean not that I, I mean, I, I guess I was baptized in the Orthodox Church. I wouldn't consider myself Orthodox now, but I just have some more experience with that as well. There, there's something like confession. Famously in the Catholic Church, also other churches do it too. Um, but can you talk through, you know, what's going on? Now, you know, there's certain uh, original sin components to that that I would disagree with, it, uh, you know, depending on the church. But it's clear that w we understand some some benefit of just talking through packs in your life. So that's causinatio. And that's a psychological process that, of course, the alchemists projected onto this pro this uh, substance they were desiccating. And of course, salt is the result. Because that's what happens when you, you know, go through experience and, and learn a lesson from it. Is you're wise, you're, you're more wise now, but also you're kind of bitter about it. Okay, and then the second step here is solutio. Salutio. This is you're desiccated, you're dried out, now you're adding water back to it. You're in this uncomfortable, dried out, kind of feel like a raw nerve. You know, I think a lot of people, um, I know when I've gone through some pretty significant uh, calcinatio points in my life, I felt like a raw nerve. You know, just walking around a little bit on edge, and so you got to take the edge off, and that's when you add water, add some kind of solution back to it, to in a sense retreat back into the comfort of protection, of isolation, of maybe not feeling like such a raw nerve. Um, you know, a great example of this that Edinger brings up in Anatomy of the Psyche that I know I brought up before is. Well, which is why I'm bringing it up now. He has a bunch of examples, but I'm just bringing this up now because I brought it up before, is Artemis and Acteon. Right? Acteon, the hunter, sp spies on Artemis. I mean, accidentally, he's not being a total creep, but he, you know, he sees this woman swimming in this lake or this pond. He's like, oh, I'm interested. And he looks, and what happens is he turns into a stag, and then his hunting dogs turn on him. In a sense, retreating back into your instinctual nature. That this is symbolized very much. Going, you know, just talked about Catholicism in church. I mean, this is going back into the church. This is back in the church for some kind of emotional reprieve from the difficulties of dealing with reality, dealing with the reality of who you are. Going back into the womb, back into the mother. Battle from deliverance of the mother. Change is always two steps forward, one step back. I just do not believe. I, I, I mean, if I have a client who's gone through a lot of change and then they come back to me one week and they go, yeah, I've kind of regressed here and oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm back to this old habit. I mean, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, oh, good. Then this is authentic change. Because if it was inauthentic change, if it was a pretense to change, then he would keep growing and, and changing. Oh, everything's going great and I'm not re retreating. I'm not regressing at all. I'm like, mm. Either you're lying to me or we're in, in for a huge regression coming up. So, you know, have a cheat day is what I'm saying. You're like, we, we have cheat days and diets where you eat well all week and then on Saturday you have like, you know, the, the pint of ice cream or whatever. You do, do the same thing with your psychology. You know, you can only put your libido out into the environment so much. You can only express it so much um, you know I don't care how good you get with this stuff I don't care how psychologically resilient you get you can only express it so much you gotta retreat back you gotta watch Netflix um, you know you gotta sit around in your you know whatever mesh shorts you know <laughs> get some mesh shorts get, you know get, get some sweats like you, like you have your sweats your, or your shorts your workout shorts that you wear to the gym right but then I, hopefully you have those uh shorts that are just like maybe one size too big 
you know, that you can wear as you're watching Netflix and do it, you know, plan it out. You're like, well, I'm just going to regress now for the next few hours. Don't regress too much, you know, <laughs> don't, don't, don't uh, you know, black tar heroin your, your life to death, but just something to think about. You know, I have, uh, hate to use that word, have some compassion for yourself when you do regress. It's just, you're a human. Welcome to humanity. And then the third step is coagulatio, coagulation. This is, in a sense, coming out from the church, out from the cheat day, back to reality. So you have your cheat day, <laughs> if we're going to carry this analogy. Uh, and uh, you, you got to get back on the scale, right? You have to see where you really are in reality. You need feedback from the environment. You need some kind of, uh, yeah, I mean, this is why talking to other people about what's going on. I mean, to just go back to Calcinatio, the first step. Um, you got to do that in the context of other people, right? You have to see other people seeing you. Psychic objectivity, we're going to get to in the next stage, sublimatio, sublimation. Not Freud sublimation, but um, we'll get to it. This is, in a sense, back to reality, like, um, oh, I want to step on the scale, right? Because I know I'm heavy and I don't want to see how much I really weigh. Okay, well, you got to feel that sting of reality. You, you, you can't just, I mean, you know, hanging out at the uh, Solutio, hanging out in the church, going back into the mother, the, the, the comfort of that womb. Vital, vital to change. Only in the context of you got to come out of it. You got to come back to reality, step on the scale, Oh, you know, I haven't um, talked to a girl. I haven't asked out a girl in six months. I'm afraid, you know, the next girl I asked out, she's going to say no. Yeah, she probably will say no. If you haven't asked out a girl in six months, and if you're, you're overweight, you know, on top of it, she's going to say no. But you got to feel that sting, you know. They're just like, uh, I know I talked about this before, which is it's just right to go back to the salt, the bitterness of salt, the wisdom of salt. Um, you know, you, you really got to see the look in a girl's eyes as she rejects you. You know, like that disappointment. Like she wants you to be better. You want to be better. And you both know it's just not going to happen. <clears throat> it's not going to happen for you. Not right now. You got to feel that sting. Recognition of death. You know, this is, you know, uh, really helpful to meditate on death to some degree. You know, not to a morbid degree. Well, it's not about how much you do it. It's why you do it. Um, do you feel invigorated afterwards, like a nice little healthy jolt of anxiety? Or do you just feel like, oh, well, nothing's going to matter anyways, and, and the sun's going to, you know, turn into a red giant and overtake the earth? And So, um, yeah, Jung has a really good quotation here that Enger brings up. Like, you, you really need to be able to, to, you know, Jung would call it suffering God, but we know from Book of Job what he really means by suffering God. You really need to suffer reality. Just to come in contact with reality and all that that means, whether it's the look of disappointment on a woman's face as she rejects you, whether it's the scale when it reads 213 pounds. Um, you you got to feel that sting. You know, welcome back. Doing the cows and audio thing, just talking through your life and other people looking at you, right? As I say, you got to look at their face as, as you're talking through your life. That's a great way to feel the sting. So that would be the coagulatio stage. And then the next stage would be sublimatio, sublimation. We all know sublimation from Freud, right? A defense mechanism, a healthy defense mechanism where a lower energy, a lower libidinal energy becomes a higher one. I mean, this is where we take maybe, you know, I would say my emotional diagram. If you take sadness and you turn it into anger, you take sadness and turn it into assertiveness. To the extent that you are sad and depressed, we can, we can process that and then make you uh, assertive, actually, whatever the opposite of sadness and depression is, we can do that as, you know, what well, we just got to become aware of, uh, of the sadness and talk through it. Uh, that's not really what uh, the alchemists meant by supplement. You know, they, they really just meant an objectification, an awareness of what was going on, an awareness of the entire process. So something that I've talked about here, something that Jung talks about, of course, is just the objectification of your demons. I mean, can you be honest about what's going on? So classic one is perfectionism. You know, guys are perfectionists and they say, oh, I just want something to be right. And I got to come in and say, no, that's not what perfectionism is. 
let's be honest, it's not because you want to do a good job. Yes, you do want to do a good job. I'm sure that's part of it. I am not denying that, but we also got to be honest to the extent that you want to uh, hide. Perfectionism is a way to hide. You have anxiety. You do not want people to see you for who you really are. There's uh, maybe some intimacy issues there. You don't want to be seen, which is at the root of both fear of failure, of course, but also fear of success. You would sabotage success because you don't want to be seen. So you work really hard on something over and over and you just put like too much time into it without practicing or, or, or without iterating it in the real world. You know, go, go, go back to uh, the... Uh, you know, return to the earth, a coagulatio, without stepping on the scale. Well, we just got to be honest about what you're doing. You're afraid of change. It's actually insecurity. Now, you call it perfectionism because that seems better, but we got to be honest about uh, what's really going on. And, um, you know, same thing with laziness. Oh, I'm just lazy. Now you're not lazy. Again, going back to perfectionism. Seems very different from perfectionism, but... Perfectionist is just perfectionism is just a, a busy way of uh, of being lazy. Mm. And then mortificatio, mortification, of course, death, and this represents the death of outdated uh, beliefs. You know, just childish ways that aren't going to serve you well. So you go through all these processes. You 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 desiccate yourself. You go back into the mother, you sublimate, you see what's really going on. And then from here, with enough processing, in a sense, we get to death. This is uh, symbolized a lot by the fall, the fall of man in, in Genesis. And it goes back to what we talk about a lot here, ego, you know, ego death. Um, that there's a good sense in which your ego can die, but there's also an unhealthy sense. Is your ego dying so more healthy a more healthy ego, a more with which incorporates a sense of self that would be capital S. Self is represented at least most commonly in the West by Christ. It doesn't have to be Christ. Are you killing your ego so yourself can live? That is the idea behind mortificatio, mortification. Okay, so this is essentially becoming a podcast, which I did not I guess entirely intend, but we got to see more here. Uh, separation, separatio. This is, uh, you know, recognizing two um, disparate parts of, of yourself, maybe two distinct drives in yourself. And while well, not, we're not joining them into one, we'll, we'll, we'll do that here, not joining them into one. So, so a common like, uh, you know, push and pull that at least a lot of men feel and, and women too is... Um, What am I saying? Oh yeah, just uh, like wanting to be in a relationship, like being in a relationship that has a lot of emotional connection and then being in a relationship that's sexually exciting, right? So like these are two needs that you have and they're, they're, they're seen often because of the mind-body dichotomy as two di different parts of ourselves. So we're never really gonna be happy in a relationship. And this is why you have people doing like polyamory and you know, things like that. Because, well, look, just inherently just what man is, is we have these competing drives. We have this drive for security, but we also have this drive for adventure. Uh, and so we just need two different people. And, you know, that's one way of looking at it. And, uh, you know, if that's the stage you're going through, that's fine. I would just uh, tend to believe that, you know, based on my experience and all that I've gone through, well, how do you combine both of these things that are, are seemingly opposite into one relationship. Okay, well, in order to do that, you're going to need to bring a new level of awareness, a level of awareness that where you are right now and you're, well, this is just how humans are. And look at this evolutionary psychology explanation um, for why men cheat or, or whatever. So this is just going to be why I cheat, right? Um, it's just who I am. It's just who I am as a man. Um that's really not uh, a, a way to, well, we'll get to it in the next phase, in the final phase of the conjunctio. That's really not a, a way to combine these two seemingly disparate drives into one thing, right? This is something that we do with emotions here. How do you talk through emotions? Well, when most people talk through emotions, they look really weak. Um, 
and what we say here is, well, you got to understand, you just need to bring a new level of awareness to what an emotion is on a metaphysical level. What an emotion must be if psychology is to be a field. And then once you look at what an emotion is, once you bring an increased level of awareness to what an emotion is, then you can talk through it, not only in a way that makes you look not weak, but in a way that makes you stronger, have a stronger identity, bring more awareness to your life, and more likely to change your action in the future. Not definitely, but at least more likely to change your action in the future. But first, we need to separate out those two seemingly disparate parts. We need to recognize, yes, I have a desire to have sex with everything that moves. Yes, I have a desire for the security of, you know, a long-term relationship with somebody who I care for and have emotional connection with. You have to first separate out those two seemingly disparate drives in you to, um, in order to go on and and live a whole life. This is, in a sense, sacrificing um, being good for being whole. You know, don't be good. Be a whole, complete person. Part of what it means to be a whole and complete person is that you are in a monogamous relationship with somebody, you recognize that you do have these uh, these drives that may not be good for the health of the relationship as a whole. And then, of course, the final one is conjunctio. Alchemists were fascinated. You know, they were just fascinated. They didn't understand it, right? They were fascinated in the making alloys, how you can combine two different materials. And it, the, the resulting material isn't some kind of combination of the two. It's not like a, a strange mixture, like a, like a tie-dye t-shirt. It's a completely new thing. You, know, you combine two colors to make a completely different color. You combine two parts of yourself, two different people, and they become greater than the sum of their parts. In a sense, connection. I mean, this is what I stress here. The, the antidote to, to neurosis, to psychological disease, is connection. How well you are connected with yourself, with dif- supposedly disparate parts of yourself, how well you can integrate them into a healthy ego function that serves as a focal point to yourself, not a defense from yourself. Um, and how well you can then use that healthy ego, that healthy, well-connected ego to connect with other people. You know, this, we have this unconscious, right? I mean, it's clear we have this unconscious, right? Because we come to this place in our life, like I started out talking about, we come to this place in our life where we want to stop doing something, but we can't stop doing it. There's clearly something unconscious going on, but we need to use that, right? We can't just turn away from that. That's mindset training. That's cognitive behavioral therapy. That's stoicism. Alchemy is different. The foundation of alchemy was different, which is, it's, it's subtly different than what the church was teaching, but different enough. I mean, different enough that these things, I mean, this was capital punishment doing what these guys were doing. I mean, lots of things were capital punishment in the 1500s, 1600s, uh, you know, you know, you're, you're thinking that um, there's some kind of a Christian belief that says uh, Christ didn't always exist. He was actually begotten from God, but it, but he doesn't exist in eternity. That's it's called something. And anyways, that was a capital offense in uh, the 1500s, for instance. So, but this actual c- combining of light and dark, of God and the devil, you know, just seeing that the devil is actually hmm, maybe this isn't the devil necessarily it's just a projection of these dark irrational parts of us that we don't understand maybe a a feminine aspect of humanity this isn't something to be repressed and and just it it comes up and we got to turn away from it again doing the stoicism mindset cbt um privatio boni right god or evil is just the absence of good no there's a, a a nature to quote evil there's a nature nature to our darkness and we simply need to understand what that is there's a nature to our emotions right a lot of people when they talk about emotions you know even a lot of therapists and psychologists which is just awful and definitely perpetuates the mental health crisis they talk about emotions like they're just simply wrong and irrational and let's argue it away and this isn't a canonchio you know that this isn't a unification of your opposites and there's something greater than the whole. And that is what the alchemists understood intuitively. 
but because we figured out what chemistry is, we know they weren't talking about the metals that they were combining, right? They are talking about their own psychology. So it's actually very insightful to what we all need to go through right now, whether you want to call it therapy or, or simply psychological change. We can help you with that here at Animus. We do free consultations, animusempire.com slash schedule. Some of these steps I went through, I mean, they're, they're pretty specific, and I definitely recommend, you know, you read Edinger's book. That There's some really good Jungians. There's a lot of Jungians out there who I wouldn't recommend. They just don't add anything. Edinger is different. He definitely adds something uh, to what Jung said. At least makes it more palpable. So that's good. But we have a way of talking through these steps. We're going through these seven alchemical steps. We don't put it in terms of alchemy because I don't know how helpful that is ultimately. I mean, it is helpful, right? That's why I'm relating it back to alchemy and saying like, look, th there's a methodology to therapy and it's not just crazy old Mark saying that, right? Because people have been saying this in effect for hundreds, if not thousands of years, especially if you go back to the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, Thoth, Toth, uh, Hermes. I'll just call it Hermes. Especially if you go back to the Emerald Tablets of Hermes, you know, we, we, we've known about this for... Well, depends how conspiratorial you want to get about where the Emerald Tablets really come from and who really wrote them. I mean, it could be tens of thousands of years, perhaps. I'm not saying that officially, but it could be. But we can help you make this even more concrete. How do these steps apply definitively to therapy so you can change? So you can unstuck yourself, make the decisions you want to make. AnimusEmpire.com slash schedule. Uh, and I'll leave it there. Thank you guys. And remember, it seems it seems doubtful, but I would say there is a methodology to therapy, even if it isn't that obvious.